Uh, everybody hears me well. Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. It is my pleasure to open this uh, World Migration Report webinar. My name is Celine Bolos and I'm the head of the Migration Research Unit, the head of our Migration Research and Publications Division, Mary McAuliffe, was also the World Migration Report editor, cannot unfortunately be with us today as it was initially planned. So please allow me to share her sincere apologies, especially as I know how much we have liked to be present today with us to moderate this webinar. So as you may know, the World Migration Report is IOM flagship publication and the reference reports on migration globally. It is IOM main contribution to strengthening the global evidence based on migration and migrants worldwide to support states in policy formulation, review processes, and to combat disinformation on migration and migrants. The report is published every two years and the latest edition, the World Migration Report 2022, was launched last 1st December by our Director General at the 112th session of IOM Council. We have organized the first virtual events uh, right after the launch of the World Migration Report, on the 2nd of December, we are deputy with our Deputy Director General for Operations. And this first webinar provided an overview of the report and its digital tool. It was widely attended and reflecting actually a never growing interest for evidence-based information and analysis on migration and migrants by an increasingly diversified audience. And you can find the recording of the webinar on the World Migration um, Report webpage. Since the beginning of the year, we have started to, uh, we have actually initiated a World Migration Reports webinar series to respond to those needs and interests of this uh, grow, ever growing audience. And each webinar focused on one specific chapter of the World Migration Report. We have started with chapters of part one, which provide key data and information on migration and migrants, before we will turn to thematic chapter of part two which focus on complex and emerging migration issues. So together with the different digital tools we have recently developed, such as the award-winning World Migration Report interactive webpage and our new um, World Migration Interactive in Educators Toolkit that you can find online, this webinar are really important for us because they're part of our endeavor to constantly improve the knowledge on migration and migrants globally. And this is something that is central for us and to research and analysis to go further and not limit itself to a research community, but also uh, reach a vast and diversified audience. So I'm really pleased to see online actually some familiar names uh, joining us today from very different background. Uh, I see some government officials, practitioners, uh, private sector as well, and researcher, of course. And thank you very much for being here with us today. So today webinar will focus on chapter four of the report, uh, which um, explores uh, migration research and analysis. And for this specific 2022 edition, uh, the chapter more particularly focused on recent contribution from the United Nations. So as you will hear today uh, from today's presentation, the United Nations system plays an important role in contributing to migration research and analysis. The organizations, the different agencies, uh, funds, and so on, are uniquely placed to actually gather data given the presence in the field and the relationship with governments, officials, and governmental bodies. And the UN system also often acts as a bridge between the research community and policymakers, which is allowing this vital cross fertilization between these two worlds. Uh, before passing the floor to our speakers today, please uh, let me just remind you that this webinar is recorded, so you will be able to find it online on YouTube afterwards. In the interest of time, uh, we will keep questions uh, for the question and answer session, the QA session after the presentation. However, you can uh, directly type your burning question if you have one uh, by using the in the chat, actually in the chat box. Uh, I will collect this question and direct them to our speakers today. So without further ado, I'm pleased to pass the floor to my colleague, Dr. Pablo Rojas-Copari, who is Senior Research Officer within our division. 
and uh, I won't read his full bio, you can find it online. I'm trying to condense the bios here, but he has a very impressive background, of course. Uh, but I'd rather he hear from you, Pablo, than, uh, and, and let our, our participants check your bio online. Thank you. Thank you, Celine. Um, good morning and good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you're joining us from today. Um, very happy to be here with you and very happy to give you a very brief overview of uh, chapter four of the World Migration Report 2022, which if you have not read yet, I will of course encourage you to um, do so um, whenever you have some um, time. Um, I'll try to keep my presentation uh, succinct, also to allow for uh, the, the words from our, our fellow discussants and to have an um, interactive Q&A at the end. I'm going to sh just share my screen and uh, if you have any problem, uh, please let me know if it's not working. So, okay, that should be working fine. Yes. Right, so we are now, uh, as uh, uh, Celine already outlined, the webinar series that we are um, <clears throat> undertaking at the, in the, in the, in the division. Um, so, so we are at chapter four, um, which focuses on migration research and analysis. And for this particular edition, we are uh, focusing on the recent e UN contributions. Uh, a short summary of uh, of the key findings and and, and, and the outline of the, of the chapter uh, as this is a, a chapter that has been present in the last three editions so from uh, 2018 and 2020 and it's a chapter that we can say that builds on on, on foundations so it's uh, analyzing and outlining uh, the evolution of uh, migration research and analysis uh, from different stakeholders uh, in this particular chapter, as I said, uh, we will focus on the UN system uh, and its role as a producer of knowledge and research on migration. There's a number of reasons why we are focusing on, uh, on, on, on the UN this time, uh, particularly given the, the adoption of uh, the Global Compact, Compact for Migration, the establishment of the UN Network on Migration and the uh, forthcoming a international Migration uh, Review Forum, which will take place in May this year in New York. So we thought it was timely to uh, dedicate a bit more uh, focus on, uh, on the role of the UN system. Um, I guess maybe just uh, if, we, if we had to limit uh, to key, four key findings, we would say that the chapter covers particularly the, the rapid expansion of disinformation on migration and how it has changed the public discourse as never before. Of course, when we started the production of uh, the World Migration Report uh, 2022, um, we didn't envisage uh, the, the pandemic that ensued and that has changed um, a lot uh, also in the production of research and knowledge, uh, but not only on migration on many topics, but also on migration. Uh, another key point, another key finding is that uh, the nature of publishing continues to change. We have already touched upon those issues in previous editions, but uh, we have um, uh, previously talked about the, the, the diversification of, of, of the publishing process, the difference between white and gray literature, uh, and the rise in self-publishing. All of those continue to emerge uh, uh, and continue to expand. And what we see is that research outputs, including from the United Nations system, have become more and more diversified to um, address the, the needs of uh, different audiences, but also to, uh, ch to challenge the, the expansion of this information. And by these diversified shape forms, we're, we're talking about data visualizations, portals, blogs, podcasts and many ways of making sure that we can communicate research to uh, those um, who are interested in it. As Celine had already said, one of the key findings of this report is the fact that the unique place that organizations in the UN system have because they are uh, on, in the field, they can collect data and they also, uh, because um, they can act as a bridge between pol the worlds of policy and research. As we know, we are uh, are particularly interested in in, poly, in 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 applied research and in 
and in policy research. And we're, oh, we're in, in, in our work, we constantly try to see how we can better um, bridge the, 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 the so-called gap between those two worlds. And the final uh, key finding we can say is that um, COVID-19 has uh, had a, a great impact on uh, the production of research. Uh, has also had, a, as I said before, uh, generated a large uh, number of uh, disinformation or a large quantity of disinformation and misinformation. Um, but it has also affected the research resource allocation with priorities shifting. And that has, of course, impacted um, um, research on migration and, and other aspects of social sciences as well. But uh, in, it's interesting also to here see how the UN system have been both affected by this, uh, this, this changing resource allocation, but has also how it has been responsive to it. Um, moving forward here, it's a, um, a little table that I created to summarize more or less how, um, how the, this particular chapter has evolved. So it just shows that you know we we started when we started the series back in 2018. We were talking uh, a lot about um, the the increase in 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 on in, the increasing interest in the research and analysis of migration that was taking place at the same time as the nature of publishing uh, uh, the processes were changing. Um, at the time, we were talking about increased number of open access platforms, and we even in the first edition in, in, in 2018 uh, gives a good an, um, analysis of the strengths and weaknesses weaknesses of academic and non-academic publications, and and what was uh, the case for that particular edition and the subsequent one in 2020 was it, it had a very good overview of the main producer of migration research and analysis, particularly by summarizing publications uh, from the main academic journals. Uh, in 2020, we talked a little bit about uh, the, we, we talk about the, the rise in self-publishing. We started talking about the importance of uh, um, an increased recognition that uh, we were seeing about the, the, the need for evidence-based policymaking, um, as well as uh, touching on the, the growth of um, collaborative research on migration in the UN system. Uh, much to do with the uh, JIU report, which we, which I will mention on a bit uh, just after this. And so this brings us to our, our current edition, where as you see, we have been building on these foundations and we are now decided to focus on the UN system um, as a producer of knowledge and, uh, and discussing um, the, the gaps uh, between the policy and, and academic world. And, in, in, in a context of increasing uh, challenging env uh, environment due to disinformation and misinformation. So we, you, in, in the chapter as well, you have a summary of the uh, recent contributions which are focusing on um, organizations which are members of the executive committee of the UN Network on Migration. Uh, I, I, I understand that this uh, chart is very hard to read. Um, but it's uh, it's an annex to the chapter to, to our chapter, um, and it, it, this chart gives you an overview of the UN system. As you can see, it's uh, quite large, and it's a, it, it allows you to understand more or less the different reporting lines and so on. And guess what? We can uh, a couple of things to note from this uh, graph is well, first of all, the huge diversity in terms of structure uh, in the UN system. Um, and also the, the another key point that the, chart, the, the, the chapter makes is that research is, is being carried out, takes place in, at different levels in different places in the UN. Of course, there are a couple of uh, bodies which are specifically um, uh, focused on research, such as a few research institutes, including also the UN, uh, UN University, um, uh, as well as uh, other um, <clears throat> other bodies, which are some of the report to the General Assembly, some report to the Economic and Social Council. Um, but again, uh, to make the point, uh, research is being carried out inside agencies and inside funds uh, as well. So uh, please consult this chart. It's a very useful summary of like the world that the UN system represents. Um, this uh, is a repeat uh, graph, uh, so from the edition of uh, 2020, that we have decided to include again an annex in this edition. Um, why? Because it, it gives us a timeline of the uh, of the 
the development of both the Global Compact on Refugees and the Global Compact for Migration and the development of the United Nations Network on Migration. Um, this is particularly relevant uh, because of the, the, the impact that the network uh, is supposed to have, not only on the implementation of the GCM, but in just in, in creating a more collaborative, collaborative approach uh, in terms of uh, migration um, governance, uh, but also, you know, and of course, the development of research uh, and the sharing of knowledge, which is, of course, uh, are all related to the, the GCM objective number one, and, but, and also responds to some of the uh, SDGs. So just again, because of it, it, its importance, uh, uh, allow me to focus a little bit on the uh, the United Nations Network on Migration. Um, so it was established uh, in 2018 and to help coordinate the, the UN system support to member states in the implementation, follow-up and review of the Global Compact for Migration. So as you understand, the Global Compact for Migration, it's a state-led uh, commitment and the UN system is there to support them to meet the, the, this commitment in terms of, and, and to meet their different objectives that are stipulated in the GCM. The network coordinator is IOM, uh, which is represented by its director general, Antonio Vitorino, who is then the coordinator of the network. Uh, there is a secretariat of the network. Uh, it's staffed by IOM, but it's open to the continent from different organizations in the UN system. The role of the um, of the secretariat is to to service the work of the network. So, if you see, the network is is the network con is constituted of thirty nine organizations from all over the UN system, which are joining on a UN uh, uh, on, a, on a voluntary basis, and the secretariat then helps organize the work of the network and its assistance to different stakeholders and member states. The leadership of the network is constituted of nine organizations, which you can see the logos at the bottom of the slide, and they represent the executive committee. And what the executive committee is responsible for is to provide guidance to the work of, uh, of the network, uh, set the strategic priorities that uh, in the support to member states, and lead uh, the preparations for the IMRF. Um, the IMRF, uh, or International Migration Review Forum, uh, is due to take place uh, in May. Uh, its first edition is due to take place in May uh, 2022, so in a few weeks' time. And it's uh, it, in, in a cycle of four years, so it will be then uh, repeated again in 2026. And in between, we have uh, regional reviews which take place uh, after. Uh, moving on. Uh, Again, uh, I, I will not uh, take too much time on this slide because we have uh, the, we are very lucky and we have the pleasure of having uh, Dr. Dimitri here, who is the uh, author of uh, the uh, JIU report on the strengthening policy research uptake, which had a specific case study on, on research on migration. So this this study was um, done at the end of 2000, published at the end of 2018 looking at the level of uh, collaborative re research uh, and interdisciplinary research that exists on migration in, in the UN system and had some uh, very interesting findings um, and recommendations, particularly in enhancing uh, the connectivity and the, and, and the collaborative approach of the, the work uh, on, on research by different UN agencies. Um, uh, as, you can see in the slide one uh, one of the recommendations was to, uh, one of the findings and its ensuing recommendation was to look at a, a more systematic process of collaboration. So it will, it will be very uh, it will be very interesting to hear from Dr. Dimitri the the, um, the extent to which some of these issues were addressed uh, uh, in the system. So I'll, I'll move on to the next slide. Um, so then I'll, I'll take you through the four main uh, parts of the of this chapter of chapter four, uh, which focus first on uh, as on the UN system as a producer of knowledge and, and it first in its capacity as a, a data collection. I already said at the beginning of uh, of my presentation that the UN system is uh, uniquely placed. Uh, organizations in the UN system are uniquely placed uh, to collect data because of. Uh, 
um, uh, because of its presence on the field and because of its close cooperation with national authorities. Um, there has been a recognition that we that there is a demand on migration data to better understand migration, but also to better formulate migration policy and migration data. That has been uh, that arises from the uh, 2030 agenda, um, and it has been reinforced by uh, the Global Compact for Migration, and particularly Objective One, which talked about uh, uh, collecting and, and, and sharing data on migration. Uh, again, we have to talk that uh, it put this in, in the context of the publication of the UN data strategy, which uh, was published in 2020 and runs the uh, first UN data strategy that runs until 2022. And uh, this is also just even to, to acknowledge the fact that multiple UN agencies that they regularly collect and publish migration data, aside from other types of data, but it will be focusing here on migration data. Um, the, the, the main ones uh, that we uh, that we talk about are UNDESA, UNHCR, ILO, which collect data on the specific aspects of migration, and these are complemented by data sets from other organizations such as OECD or IDMC. IOM, of course, has uh, pro provides its own efforts uh, in data collection, for example, uh, the displacement tracking matrix, and it produces aggregation of data, for example, through the migration data portal and through the uh, visualization as well, including the World Migration Report Interactive that was mentioned earlier on. Um, uh, the UN system also provides uh, capacity building on uh, on 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 the research um, and data collection. One of these examples here is the Migration Network Hub, uh, which was uh, a response was launched in March 2021, and um, it came up as a response to uh, the commitment in the GCM for a uh, particularly in paragraph 43 for a capacity building mechanism. Um, this is together with the uh, uh, MPTF, which is the, the multi-partner trust fund. Both together uh, represent this uh, uh, demand, uh, respond to this demand to, to bring cohesion in the, work, in the work of all the actors in the network. Um, and, and so what the network hub does is it uh, gathers, it aggregates and gathers data, uh, include all types of data, including reports and so on, on and, um, classifies them according to the uh, global the one, one of the th according to the 23 GCM objectives uh, also through cross-cutting teams and by geographical scope yeah, allowing then um, users to browse through uh, a large volume of uh, knowledge and, and different products yeah it's also a one-stop shop for accessing documents related to the implementation of the GCM such as uh, Every, all documents published by the working groups of the work, the regional reviews, and of course, it will be the place to go to look at documentation relating to the forthcoming IMRF. The, the Network Hub has also a repository of practices, which showcase re replicable practices, um, which serve as inspiration for actors involving in GCM implementation at global, national, regional, and local levels. So this is a way for, um, people to try and, and including um, government stakeholders to look at practices which can be transposed and help them advance their commitments to, towards the GCM. It uh, finally it also includes at ec an expert database which uh, provides access to a range of migration experts around the world such as academics, researchers and practitioners uh, according to their th thematic expert expertise. All the content in the network hub is peer reviewed by uh, members of the peer review roster. Um, another point uh, to, that I mentioned already before that the chapter goes into more detail is around the, uh, the issue of misinformation and disinformation, which it acknowledges that it's not a new phenomenon and that uh, academic research has been focusing on it for uh, different aspects of it already, such as fact checking, the role of debunking, the role of online technology in spreading misinformation and how to minimize its impact. But as, as um, was mentioned before, the COVID-19 pandemic accelerated uh, uh, exponentially the growth of, uh, of, the, of false information and its spread, and it made it more difficult to identify trustworthy and reliable sorts of information. So the chapter goes into um, how that has impacted both mig migration and migrants through the spread of false information uh, on the role uh, in the pandemic, but also 
it talks about how uh, uh, the UN system has responded to this by creating a number of initiatives such as Verify, it takes a community and new things that might be um, coming forward such as the Global uh, Migration uh, Media Academy from the IOM. And as well, it talks a bit about the impact on the um, on this resource allocation of research uh, uh, in the UN system and outside. Finally, uh, oh, um, sorry. The, the, the another po another point that uh, subsection of the chapter is on the collaboration between the UN system and the scientific community. So here it reminds us that there is a long-standing uh, collaboration between different organizations in the system and the academic world. That is shown, for example, through the support of uh, direct support to academic journals, such as you know, and, and some organizations that are, include uh, ILO, WHO, UNESCO, as well as IOM and UNHCR that focus on migration-related journals. In particular, here we we, we mentioned um, that IOM established the first scientific journal on migration in 1961, which later became International Migration and continues to be supported by the organization. Another such journal that is supported by both IOM and UNHCR is the Fourth Migration Review. Aside from that, there are many other um, co collaborations with the, uh, between the UN system and the scientific community. In the aspect of migration, for example, it's, it's notable to mention here that IOM convened the Migration Research Leader Syndicate to support and facilitate the expert knowledge in the development of the GCM, and it has since then established a group of migration research and publishing high-level advisor, which continues to advise IOM in terms of engagement with academia and publishing. Um, finally, it focuses also on new ways of uh, disseminating migration research analysis, focusing on the role of the World Migration Report as a series, um, looking at how we respond to the changing nature of public publishing, including by developing new ways of uh, uh, of visualizing and sharing data uh, and, uh, through its interactives, uh, interactive, which is uh, um, it's in the second edition now. It's an, an award, the first edition won an award in terms of uh, uh, presenting data. And then uh, it also uh, acknowledges the need to tailor uh, the outputs of the of the of migration research and the, the content of the World Migration Report in particular through a series of different toolkits that were developed for, to cater for fact checkers, educators and policy makers. So to conclude my final point, and I hope I haven't uh, overstepped my time, um, there is uh, three key points. Um, that providing evidence-based analysis on migration has never been as critical uh, um, as uh, it results now on the combination of both increased misinformation um, but also the continuous politicization of migration uh, across the globe. Um, it's important that we continue to encourage policymakers, practitioners and academics to explore uh, migration research and analysis with a critical eye. And it's important that we consider, we continue to find ways in which we can provide uh, access to this research and analysis. And finally, a reminder that uh, the organizations in the US system are best placed to listen, create and share knowledge on migration, particularly in order to counteract misinformation, but also to help craft, craft more sustainable policy responses, which are based on evidence and rigor. So here, Final slides, just to remind you that the War Migration Report uh, will be translated in a number of uh, languages in the coming uh, uh, months. So please stay tuned for that. And that we are, uh, we that there will be uh, uh, also uh, access to different um, uh, resources such as the interactive and the toolkits and, and so on. So thank you for uh, your time and uh, I'm happy to answer some questions uh, in the question and answer session later. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pablo. Uh, timing was perfect. Thank you for that. So I don't have to uh, to, to chase people for um, for, sticking, for sticking to time. Uh, and, and your presentation, and I think that's something that that's highlighted at the beginning of your chapter um, that you wrote with Mary, um, and that is also said in previous edition, but I think that's something you haven't mentioned, but it's just as well, let me underline perhaps, because it also gives like part of weight to what you're saying is we normally, um, or I mean, I would say in the academia, when you work in the academia, we normally like distinguish between what we call white literature and gray literature. So of course the white between being like the academic one, which is supposedly uh, of uh, higher uh, standards and quality 
than the gray one. But it's true, like when you were talking about the first report back in 2002, uh, we couldn't imagine that a pandemic was going to rise. We couldn't imagine the, the, the increase in, um, in misinformation and disinformation, uh, including that is triggered by social media and different self-publishing uh, endeavors. And at the same time, we couldn't imagine that the UN, and I think there's been a huge, a huge improvement in that is that the United Nations organization for some of them now have really like a quality um, assurance mechanism in place that were previously only used by the academia, but now increasingly used uh, by United Nations organizations as well. So of course, uh, easy for us to say because we do that for the World Migration Report, but we know as well that's the case uh, for their publications. So yes, I shouldn't talk too much because otherwise uh, I don't stop myself and we have someone way more interesting to listen to uh, than myself, I would say. I'm really pleased to give the floor to our first discussant today, uh, with whom we had previously the chance to collaborate, Dr. Petru Dumitriou. He is a senior fellow at the Diplo Foundation, but we actually um, started collaborating with uh, Petru back at a time when he was inspector at the Joint Inspection Unit, so that's the GIU and the report um, that Pablo was referring to is the one on strengthening policy research uptake. So there was a pleasure to collaborate with you, Petru, and we know you have a, a wonderful um, diplomat career, but also uh, uh, an academic one with, the, with your doctorate, you watch your thesis on the UN reform, uh, you have published extensively as well on various topics of uh, UN topics, including a book on UN reform as well. So it's a pleasure to have you here and to listen to your comments for the next five minutes. Thank you very much, Petri. Hey, thank you, Celine, and thank you for inviting me to this uh, uh, debate. Uh, of course, I'm happy like everybody else, but we don't uh, celebrate the International Year of Happiness. We celebrate the report, uh, the World Report on Migration. So I'm going straight to the subject, trying to make five points in five minutes. The first point is uh, about this relationship between um, IOM and uh, uh, GIO. IOM, for uh, those who don't know, is not among the 28 participations, uh, participating organizations of the Joint Inspection Unit. Uh, yet we had a, a very good uh, dialogue on the matter. And what we found were at least two coincidences. IOM coincided uh, uh, with us uh, with respect to the pertinence of our case study on migration. So we, we picked up this case study on migration and uh, 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 about the substance and the main conclusion, the position and the interest of IOM were for us a test of relevance for the whole report addressing policy research uptake in the UN system. Because of course we discussed not only not only migration uh, but also uh, the issue of policy research uptake in general. The, the, the other uh, the other coincidence that I'd like to mention is the. Um, is the fact that we found elements of coincidence between our conclusion, uh, the reports of GIU and the contents of Global Compact, which was known to us after the completion uh, of the uh, collection the na analysis of data in preparation for the GIU report. Because, you know, uh, it is quite rare to see that much uh, substance on research in a, in a politically adopted document check uh, my, my assertion, I think I've never seen in another document that much about the importance of uh, uh, the accuracy of data collection of the research. The second point is uh, also to explain why we choose migration as a topic for a case study while we had probably uh, scores of possible other topics. Uh, we might say retrospectively that the best reason was that we didn't want to be contaminated by a pro-domo uh, vision uh, uh, of an organization uh, which might have been the, you know, the lead agency in, uh, in uh, dealing with that issue. But it was not the reason. At the time, uh, at the time, the real criteria were two. First of all, was the uh, we had in mind. Um, a sample of interdisciplinary research. Migration is indeed the, the thematic mandate of a lead organization, but it also impinges on, on the concerns and activities of other entities in the United Nations system. Secondly, we needed an example of collaborative research, uh, one that implies at least uh, 
some form of systematic and institutionalized processes of collaboration among uh, uh, one or more uh, organizations. We did not consult the IOM on the terms of reference of our project, uh, but we find out that uh, there were uh, a very telling example in this, in this respect, and I think I'm grateful that you reproduced uh, some of the information we collected in your report. Uh, number three, uh, both the World Migration Report and the JAYU Report on Policy Research Uptake identified several such areas uh, that uh, have, uh, um, for which migration as a phenomenon has an impact uh, that uh, was translated into research needs for other uh, um, uh, United Nations organizations than IOM. I just mentioned the, the major one, economic, social, environmental, human rights, peace and security and governance. And we, we mentioned that in the report. In other words, uh, what is valid for migration might also be valid for other topics of concern for the United Nations uh, system, like the status of women or the children or access to natural resources and others. Um, point number four. Your report refers to the uh, United Nations as the global disseminator of facts. I personally <laughs> applaud this uh, approach because it does not say IOM is the global disseminator of facts, although in fact it is, even if other several organizations produce and disseminate statistics and facts about the migration. Why is it at that point important? What I mean is that in the eyes of the public opinion and even of some uh, uh, better informed politicians, they, the United Nations is seen a, as a whole with little or no distinction among the individual protagonists. Um, how many times have you heard or seen news like the United Nations condemns the violation of human rights in Ruritania? Without paying attention, if that is the if the condemnation comes from independent rapporteur, you know, a, a person from a body of experts or from from uh, an intergovernmental organ like uh, uh, the Human Rights Council, etc. What I uh, imply here is that the United Nations system has a collective responsibility about the quality and accuracy of the research products they provide as global public goods, because we should never forget that we provide knowledge is the main product of the United Nations system, and we uh, uh, whatever we give to the world is a global public good. Number number five is to uh, see that, to, to say to those who don't know, uh, uh, are not familiar with the JAI reports that we, we focus our recommendations on the, uh, the enhancing coherence and efficiency in the use of resources, in that particular case, the resources devoted to, to research, by avoiding duplications, unjustified divergences, fragmentations. So that is a kind of uh, positive approach. But uh, the, the last edition of IOM report signals the sensitivity of migration uh, as a topic that might be subject to contestation, to polarization, and in particular misinformation. Again, ideally uh, for, for me, and I don't see it as very complicated, I think that all research launch on behalf of the United Nations uh, uh, system should ideally be a subject to a kind of soft peer review by all interested and competent organizations uh, because that would mean that, you know, we make sure that they know that something is, exists already from a very authoritative source, so we should not spend money for other, for parallel studies and parallel research. So these are my five points. Uh, if you ask me later a question, I will talk about the implementation and acceptance of, of GI recommendations. Thank you. Thank you very much, Petro. Of course, I will ask later the question <laughs> and we'll see. We don't have any questions yet in the chat, but uh, please participants, uh, feel free to, to uh, even make a comment um, if you don't agree or if you, or if you really agree. I, I really like to point out that something that, that was clear in the reports, all the kind of interlinkages between, um, between the different agencies and your organization, 
Uh, and the fact, as you say, and I and I really like the image that you give, Petru, when you talk about um, knowledge as a as a public good, and I think uh, indeed it is a global public good, and we have the responsibility to um, to um, try to reach a certain standard, including in terms of quality. And I think there's a like a huge improvement, as I said before. Uh, but it's also a, a global improvement that needs to be done like across the organizations. So I will keep my question for you afterwards. Indeed, I'd be super interested to know um, what are the, uh, where, where, where the, the implementation of the recommendation you made in your report at Standing Uh But beforehand, if you allow me, I'd like to pass the floor to our second discussant who regularly uh, actually collaborate with us. Um, she is uh, Dr. Cecilia Cannon, who is a senior researcher at the Global Graduate, uh, the Graduate Institute sorry, for International and Development Studies, and she also sits in the board of directors of the Academic Council of the United Nations Systems. So, um, Cecilia, I don't know actually, because there's so many things that you could talk about, given as well, like the different type of uh, collaboration we've had the chance to have with you, including for uh, the development of a world migration um, toolkit for policy officials that is funded by the Geneva, um, Geneva Science Policy Interface in Geneva. So which address more like the way we can communicate research and the impact that research can have in policy cycle. But I, that's going to be a surprise for me because there's so many different perspectives you could take. So please, the floor is yours and thank you again to be here with us today. Thank you, Celine, and thank you and congratulations to you and Pablo, Adrian, Mari and the whole team who worked on the World Migration Reports because I really find it such a useful, well-researched and accessible resource, so it's really great. Um, what I would like to focus on in, in five minutes, so I'll be quick, um, is I'll draw out two points that were raised in this chapter and that Pablo also raised in his presentation now, um, which, which in my view really raise really promising developments in the UN system regarding migration research in recent years and really across the last decade and a half. And then I'll add a third point that's really from the recent survey and interviews that we conducted with policy actors exactly on this process um, in this, in this um, project to develop the policy um, toolkit, the digital toolkit for policy actors in collaboration with um, IOM's research division and supported by the Geneva Science Policy um, Interface. So the, that's how I'll structure this five minutes. So first, looking at the, the chapter that was just presented, um, it really outlines how UN bodies and organizations have come to be a key source of data knowledge and analysis. And they really, the chapter points to how many of these organizations are really in possession of data on the latest trends and statistics, as well as real-time information relating to the changing and evolving nature of issues like migration. So the chapter emphasizes that this is really thanks to their work and the networks that they have at the country level and in the field um, and their close work with policy actors, including governments who are their member states, local governance actors, regional governance actors, as well as other stakeholders working at the country level. So this produces naturally through its everyday work, this enormous rich um, you know, source of data and real time information on the rapidly evolving issues such as migration. Um, so this data and information, even before any analysis, is really a useful resource, resource um, in and of itself. And for many, you know, decades since the creation of the United Nations, even before that with other international organizations, you know, students and scholars have really taken the time to make use of this data and, and information and access it. But traditionally, it's been a very time consuming exercise. It's, it's something, um, you know, where even, you know, when I was doing my PhD now uh, 10 years ago, but it, you have to go department by department, you have to go organization by organization, spend time, you know, rummaging through the archives, interviewing people, really having to sort of uncover the data and information. It wasn't so readily accessible um, as it is now. And, and so it's, you know, it's always been a valuable research. Um, but what I really appreciate, and the chapter really emphasizes this by drawing together all of the different, um, you know, bodies within the UN, first producing data and, and analysis on migration research, but the real efforts through the developments and evolution of the networks, the developments of data platforms and, and data centers, etc. It has just made it so much more accessible, um, not only for scholars and, and researchers, but really for policy actors 
to be able to be better informed in terms of um, access to that data and information and research, etc. Um, so it's really that that you know I wanted to really stress that um, the the value of the that the UN system has with that network on the ground, just producing this rich data and now through digital platforms, et cetera, really becoming more accessible um, and processes like the Global Compact for Migration and what led to that in the decade, you know, and a bit beforehand um, have really contributed to that, to speeding up, up that accessibility to it, which is really great. Second is really just thinking about the um, evolving nature of migration itself and the specific aspects of migration, which Petru and, and Pablo both mentioned, um, really, you know, affect nearly all uh, bodies and organizations within the United Nations system. Um, and we know from the literature on social movements and, you know, transformative issue campaigns and looking at influence in policy processes and all of this sort of thing, which is what I used to focus my research on. But we know the role that research play, the key role that research plays in defining issues, new issues, but also evolving issues and highlighting to whom or what causality of the issue is attributed. Um, and this in turn has implications on how global challenges are addressed and the policy solutions that are that are de designed to, to solve them, which policy actors, um, you know, are, are sort of brought in to address the issue, how, you know, what lens they're sort of viewing the issue through, is it a criminal justice approach, is it a human rights approach, a development approach, um, etc. And so research has, you know, we've known for a long time, played a key role in that defining the issues and shaping the different types of policy solutions that have come about. But what policy actors have really stressed in recent years, as well as UN bodies, IOM and other UN bodies, is the cross-cutting nature of the, the issue of, of migration, um, which really requires cross-cutting policy solutions in order to address the, the issues that arise around migration. And again, here, you know, it comes back to this creation and expansion of the networks and the, the platforms on migration, which are really facilitating um, in, in the last decade and a half, you know, much more than, than previously, this ability to sort of look at the data, look at the information in a cross-cutting manner, um, much more, much, in a much um, more accessible way for, for policy actors or anybody, any stakeholders working, um, you know, on migration. And that is encouraging and will hopefully continue to encourage then cross-cutting, um, you know, policy solutions to actually address migration, which are really needed. Um, and then so finally, turning to um, insights that we gathered in this collaborative project from 26 policy officers working on migration, 19 working at the country, that, uh, from 19 countries, we um, heard from um, eight um, representatives working in permanent missions to the United Nations in Geneva, and 18 government actors working on migration at the country level. Um, but basically, you know, we asked them how they use migration research in their work. Um, we sort of find, wanted to find out from them what's useful, what challenges they face, etc. Um, and what came back loud and, and, and clear was really the strong need for migration research and analysis to inform their work on a daily basis because of all of the, the challenges that Petru mentioned, um, Pablo mentioned, um, Sabine, you've touched on too, but with rising misinformation, the really contested nature of migration, um, etc. Um, they really need to access migration um, research on a daily basis to keep up on latest migration trends and issues constantly evolving, especially during times like COVID-19, preparing policy options for decision makers, preparing speeches, talking points, responding to questions and inquiries, preparing internal papers and background briefs, developing positions on new and evolving issues, correcting misinformation on migration, um, and highlighting key issues and topics with other colleagues. Um, so these were all reasons that the policy actors mentioned that they really, you know, go to, to use migration research on a daily basis in their work right now. So it's really needed. Um, but they also stressed, you know, there's a lot of emphasis on the difference between the long academic and the difficult, um, you know, ac accessibility of long academic papers vis-a-vis -vis shorter policy documents, etc. But it was really interesting to hear the policy actors themselves say that summary outputs are very useful. Um, and then at the same time, it's also today in this, in this you know, um, period of, of contested information and, and misinformation to have access to the full sources and the full bodies of research and the original data and et cetera in those um, shorter summaries. They also really stress the importance of language translation. Um, the World Migration Report does a fantastic job of translating the reports, but it's amazing how challenging 
um, raising funds for, for translation, which is not a lot of funds usually, but many UN bodies face for, for translating research um, outputs. And just emphasizing that in my view is important um, because it really, and this came through in the, the survey and the interviews that we conducted, it really does enhance the access um, to research and evidence-based, you know, the, the potential for evidence-based policymaking among policy actors at the country level in particular. You know, at the international level, people usually have multiple language, language skills, but at the country level, um, having that language in language, um, the research outputs in language is really, really vital. Um, so I'll finish um, now just by um, saying that of the, the 26 policy actors we um, you know, interviewed and surveyed, 88% of them are actually already using the World Migration Report in the, their work, many of them on a, on a daily basis, they said. And one of the, the quotes, I'll leave you with a quote from one of the representatives from a permanent mission in Geneva. They said, we use the World Migration Report every day. It gives the global situation around the world, shows the population of migrants, the categories of migrants, the upcoming challenges, the causes, the different difficulties managing migration, the good practices, it provides options and empirical evidence. It is very important. Um, so that's you know, really a testament to the, um, the rigorous research methodologies that, that have been applied with the World Migration Report, um, as well as by many other UN and bodies right now, but upholding those, those rigorous methodologies as Petru had mentioned and, and Celine you emphasized is, is also really key. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cecilia. And indeed, it is a testament, as you're saying, uh, and I will say to the work of Marie as well, Marie McAuliffe, who is the, the editor of the report, and has those fantastic ideas. I mean, in addition to the, the rigor she brought to the report, has also fantastic ideas of how to uh, disseminate and communicate research further. And we're really pleased to partner with you um, and looking forward to see uh, the policy official toolkit up and running. And for those who'd like uh, to have a look at the different toolkits that we have, I can share the link actually right now, the um, insights reports that um, from the, the survey and interviews that Cecilia was talking about actually is also accessible here. So thank you very much. We have one question. So I wish I could like ask my own question, but I feel like I owe to our audience to rather ask this question that rather than myself. So I may follow up with you separately because I have a personal question. Um, this question doesn't seem to be addressed to anybody uh, specifically. So I turn to you in turn. If you do so agree or if you want to reply, just let me know or do not want to reply. It comes from Bella Evidente, who says, what is your view of the better role of the UN system as an enabler slash coordinator slash convener, rather than being a doer, implementer, or producer of migration data and research? I don't know if you have a, 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 an opinion on that. I do. <laughs> I will say it's kind of a mix. Uh, but that's my own position and, uh, and, and also uh, because of the, the work that we're doing in IOM and within the Migration Research and Publications Division. But perhaps Pablo, to come back to you first, I don't know if that's something that you had a look at or uh, kept an eye out during your research. Thank you. Um, I Briefly, uh, I don't think there is a better role. I think both roles are really important. And I think part of um, this chapter and what we talked here today is about how important it is this role that the UN can have in terms of coordinating, enabling, and you know, on, on migration research analysis, but also on migration governance and migration policy making. So uh, I think the evolution and you know the, all the positive feedback that we that we had in the development of the network and so on is a testimony of one the need that there was there to coordinate and all of that the, the how the how the UN um, system managed to do that and so on. Um, so I think that part is clear, but I also think it doesn't mean that the UN does not have a role to play in terms of producing knowledge and publishing uh, research as well. And I think here it's important and, and maybe go back to previous editions of the chapter four in, 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 where we talk about um, the rhythm of publishing and the rules of publishing, some spoken, some un unspoken rules. So academic publishing has a... Uh, um, um, all of us here, we're in and out of academia, so we know that it's not it's not an unconstrained environment. Not everything gets published, and when it does get published, 
it follows a certain type of language, as Cecilia mentioned, and so on. So there is, of course, uh, a role for UN agencies to, to bring this rigor that we talked about, while at the same time making it accessible. And we just today talked about many examples of how uh, we bring um, high quality content, but in a very approachable uh, means, whether it is by translating into languages or whether it's by making it more visually appealing or more easily uh, digestible. And these are things that unfortunately, academic publishing cannot always do uh, because it has its own set of rules. Um, so I think uh, to summarize, uh, we 100% agree we have a double role. Uh, I don't think one is better than the other, they're complementary. And I think we need to continue to try to, to, to make sure that, that, that there is that, there are those both hands working together. So there you go, my two cents. Thank you, Pablo. Definitely, completely made sense. Uh, let me give the floor to Petru, as his uh, virtual hands raised. Thank you, thank you. <clears throat> I think I, I will respond uh, with different words to the same question. I, I would say that uh, first of all, the United Nations system should continue to evolve itself in, in collecting uh, data. We, the, the system has some features that are absent in any other, um, let's say, uh, highly competent institution that can do that work. It, it's about the, 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 the lack of bias. It's about the, the link to the, some values that the United Nations promoted. It's about the objectivity and the neutrality of uh, uh, the information it's collected. So there is an authority that can only come from, from that uh, uh, in the governmental system. And then at the same time, it doesn't mean that the United Nations is picking up all the statistics uh, itself. Uh, it is also a coordinator. We, uh, uh, of course, we mentioned about the organization having a field presence, as it is the case of IOM, but we don't produce uh, 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 research only uh, uh, based on field research. You collaborate with governments, you collaborate with uh, non government organizations. So all of these mix of, uh, of uh, advantages make uh, the role of, uh, of United Nations essential. That is why I would say that we produce global public goods. And the, the third nuance to, uh, to, the, to the question, we, the United Nations does not have the monopoly uh, on, on any sort of research. So nothing prevents other entities uh, you know, to, produce, uh, to produce research and uh, we, uh, we have uh, a diversity of sources and then of course we have the difficulty to, to, to orient ourselves among this uh, ocean of uh, information and uh, anecdotally speaking uh, when I was a student in the uh, economic academy of diplomatic of uh, economic studies the the economic survey on Europe of the economic uh, commission for Europe was the bible was the most uh, important source of information and statistics and of course, even at that time, there were other sources, but there was that uh, authority and prestige and, uh, and uh, uh, strength that comes with the United Nations uh, uh, research. Thank you. Thank you very much, Petru. Um, no, I agree with you. And on the, like, on the other side, as you're saying, like the, the UN doesn't have the monopoly. So, and on the contrary, like when we do research, we rely on academic research, of course. Um, but I think like one can, the two can be mutually reinforcing by the end of the day as well. Uh, and completely agree with you, Petru. Let me perhaps, uh, we have one limit, minute left that so that will give me uh, the occasion. I don't know, Cecilia, if you wanted to, to reply to the question or have a last word as I want you, to give the chance you, to all. Yeah, speakers. I don't really have anything further to add. Um, you know, everything, all the points that you, you all raised is, is really good, but also the, just the data and, and information that is um, pulled together through the, the collaboration and convening is, is, you know, like it makes it possible for, for more research to be done. So they're also really linked. Um, yeah, so agree with what you all said, thanks. Thank you very much. So um, we're coming to an end and I want to be on time to make sure that uh, our attendees and participants can um, may, may have other, other commitment and can, and can leave. Just let me, th let me thank you again or to discuss and today, Petru, thank you very much, Cecilia as well. And thank you to my colleague Pablo for the very good uh, presentation. 
The World Migration Report webinar series will continue. The next one will be next month. Of course, we can come back to you by email. You can be sure of that with more information on which topic we will cover. Now we're turning to the thematic chapters uh, as we go through the reports. So thank you very much. And I let me wish you again a good afternoon, a good morning, wherever you are, or a good evening. And thank you again all. Bye.